in false is equal to one zero negative blah for false.
Yeah, good afternoon. So I think I guess uh, can we start because uh, I'm not sure if uh, Uma is gonna join. Yeah, I think go ahead. Okay, so thank you for the benefit of those that, that will be following along. Uh, the video on YouTube. So this is the data science learning uh, community and we are going through the introduction to statistical learning. And today we'll be looking at the last part of the book, which is the exercise to chapter 13, which is about uh, multiple testing. So but there are a series of questions in which we'll try to see how uh, we can go through uh, in our discussion. So like uh, the first uh, questions uh, in which they post to us in the chapter, they were talking about suppose we test M null hypothesis, all of which are true. We control the type one error for each null hypothesis at the level of alpha for each sub problem, we should justify our answer. A, they say in total, how many type one error do we expect uh, to make? So yeah, this, uh, and they, they say we expect to make M by alpha because M by alpha, because we are having alpha as the level of our significance. So once we, we need to multiply M by alpha because M is our test of the null hypothesis. So we need to multiply that value by our level of significance so that to give us what we are going to expect. At the end. So the B part, they say that suppose that the M tests that we perform are independent. What is the family wise error rate associated with this M test? So they say that hint if two elements A and B are independent, then the probability of A in that section of B is equal to what probability of A multiplied by probability. That is the product of probability of A and probability of B. So the family-wise error rate is defined as the probability of making at least one type one error. We can think of this as one minus the probability of no type one error, which is giving us one minus one in minus alpha raised to the power of what M. 
Alternatively, they said alternatively, this can be given as uh, this. This can be given as probability of A union B, which is equals to probability of A plus probability of uh, B minus probability of A in that section of B for, but for independent test, this is given as alpha plus alpha minus alpha raised to the power of uh, minus alpha squared. C, one C, they say suppose that M is equals to what two? Okay, we want to test two uh, given set of uh, two given set of uh, null hypothesis, and that the p values for the two tests are positively what correlated, so that if one is small, then the other will tend to be small as well, and if one is large, then the other will be tend to be uh, large. So they now said, how does the family Wise error rate associated associated with this m is equals to two tests qualitatively compared to the answer in b, with m is equals to two. So they say the first suppose that the two p values are perfectly what correlated. That is the two p value we get. They are perfectly correlated. Then, if they are perfectly correlated, we will effectively be performing a single test. Thus, the family-wide error rates will, all, will be alpha. In this case, when they are positively correlated, therefore we can expect the family-wide error rates to be less than in B. So alternatively, we can solve this family-wide error rates. It can be solved by using this uh, equation where we have probability of A union B, which is equal to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection of B for perfectly uh, uh, positively correlated tests. Then probability of A intersection of B is equal to alpha. So the family-wise error, uh, the family-wise error rate is alpha, which is smaller than which is smaller than B. So I think they also said in one B here we are having two set of hypotheses, but now the P values for the two tests are negatively uh, correlated. So that if one is large, then the other will tend to be small. How does the family-wise error rate associated with this? M is equals the two tests qualitatively compared to the answer in B, with M is equals to two. So they also gave us another hint that first suppose that whenever one P value is less than alpha, then the other will be greater than alpha. In other words, we never reject both the null, we never reject, uh, we never reject both null hypothesis. Taking the equation above or two tests, here we have in probability of A union B is equals to probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection of B. In this case, considered in, in the int, then we have probability of A intersection of B is equals to zero. So probability of A union B is equals to two alpha, which is larger than which is larger than B. Okay, so I think I failed to, I forgot to put start in the chat, but I'll just pause. Maybe at the end, I'll, skip, I'll put stop at the end. Let me put it here. So that John will help. I think it will help us fix that. So question two. He said that suppose that we test M hypothesis and control the type one error for each hypothesis at level of alpha. Then we assume that all M, all M P values are independent and that all null hypotheses are true. A, select the random variable A of J equals one. If the J null hypothesis is rejected, and zero, otherwise, what is the distribution of A of J? 
So here we see that A of J follows a Bernoulli distribution, okay? Where A of J as a function of Bernoulli. So the, the B part, they say, what is the distribution of this? So what is the distribution of A of J in, in, in B? Here we can see that it follows uh, a, bi a, bi a binomial distribution where we have A of J tilde B of I into M and alpha, where M is the hypothesis and alpha uh, is going to be our confidence uh, interval. So they said, what is the standard deviation of the number of type one error that we will make? Which is, is just like uh, the variance of a binomial is MPQ. So for this situation, the standard deviation will be the square root uh, of that variance, which is a square root of M multiplied by alpha into one minus alpha, so which was going to give us uh, the value of the standard deviation. So question three, they said, uh, suppose we test M null hypothesis and control the type one error for the J null hypothesis at level of alpha for J is equals to one and M one to M. Then they say we should argue that the family wise error rate is no greater than is no greater than this. So from here we have probability of A union B, which is equals to probability of A plus probability of uh, B if A and B are independent, or probability of A plus probability of B minus probability of A intersection of B when they are not. Since probability of A intersection of B must be positive, then probability of A union B is less than probability of A plus probability of uh, B, whether, whether independent or whether independent, whether independent or not. So therefore the probability of a type one error in any of M hypotheses can be no longer than the sum of the probabilities for each individual hypothesis, which is alpha of J for the, for the jet. So we look at uh, question four, they say suppose we test M is equals to 10, we, we are testing 10 hypotheses and obtain a p-value shown in table 13.4. So these are the vector of the p-values then these are the names of all the p value. Then we are using base zero h. We are just using spring tf, okay? Uh, for this number between one to 10. Then we say, suppose that we wish to control the type one error for each null hypothesis at 5% uh, probability level. They now say which null hypothesis will we reject? So we have names of which P values that are less than 0 0.05. So we have these values. So we can see that we reject all null hypotheses where the P value is less than 0 0.05 because that is a, because in every hypothesis we set, we need to set the level of confidence. So where we have P values that is less than 0 0.05, so that is, what are the said we have going to uh, we are going to reject. Now suppose that we wish to control the family wise error rates at at five percent probability level, which null hypothesis will we reject? They say we should justify our answer. I think the year is still the same because we are going to reject null hypothesis where the p value where the p-value is less than 0 0.05. Now suppose C, it's a now suppose that we wish to control the false discovery rates at level of Q, 
is equals to 0 0.05. They say, which null hypothesis will we reject? That we should justify our answer. So here we set our criteria, okay? Whereby we say we have p-value, we have full discovery rate, where the p-values are less than 0 0.05. So we are we able to retrieve this, okay? So here we can see that we also reject, uh, we also reject at where we have p-value, where we have p-value uh, that is less than 0 0.05. Now, D, they says now suppose that we wish to control the false discovery rate at level of Q is equals to 0 0.2, okay? Which null hypothesis will we reject that we should justify our answer? So here we can set our criteria, okay? That is 0 0.2. So in this case, we still have to reject at that criteria. So where we have the false discovery rate that is less than 0 0.2, we can see all the values uh, that fall uh, at that, that met that criteria, we're able to retrieve them. So E, of the null hypothesis rejected at the false discovery rate of level of Q is equals to 0 0.2 approximately, how many are false positive that we should justify our answer? So in the solution here, we can see that we, we expect uh, 20%. In this case, two out of the eight rejections to be false uh, positive, so which give us a 20 uh, 20%. 20 so 20% to be uh, false uh, positive. Question five. You said that for this problem, uh, we will make up p-values that lead to a certain number of rejection using the bon Ferroni and Hall Benjamin Hall and the home procedure. A, they say we should give an example of, the, of five p-values, that is five number given zero and one, which for the purpose of this problem, we will interpret as p-values for which both bon Ferroni method and the Holmes method reject exactly one null hypothesis when controlling the family-wise error rate at level of 0 0.1. So here, in this case, we see that in this case, for bon Ferroni, we need one p-values. For bon Ferroni, we need one p-value to be less than 0 0.1 over 5, which is 0 0.02 and the others to be above, and the other p-value, we expect it to be above uh, the 0 0.02. So for Holmes method, we need the most significant uh, p-values to be below 0 0.1 all over five plus one minus one, which is also 0 0.02, also four. An example will, uh, will be, we have a number between one, 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 and 0 0.001. So here we have a vector of the p-values. So we have to say sum of the p-adjusters of the p-value, then the method we are using Ben Ferroni that is less than 0 0.1. So here we have, we are able to retrieve just one, uh, we're able to retrieve just one data point that for met that criteria. So when we say, we use Benjamin Horsbeck method, we are able to get back the same one approach back. We're able to get one up back. So, they said now give an example of five P values. Should give an example, I think we have done that. Should give an example of five P values for which then for only reject one null hypothesis and Holmes reject more than one null hypothesis at level of 0 0.1. So we should give an example of just five P values. So this, they created a vector of the five P values. Okay, and remember in these five B, P values, then for only is going to uh, 
reject one. Why? Why the pumps method is gonna reject uh is gonna reject uh is going to reject more than one. Okay, so we we check for the benf benferone. Okay, we can see that we get one back, which is one rejection. But when we check the Holmes method, we were able to retrieve two method. We were able to reject two. We were able to reject two based on the p value in which the five p values in which uh, we provided. So question six is said for each of the three panels in figure 13.3 in the exercise in the chapter that we went through last week, we should answer the following questions. Okay, there are always eight positive, which is red and two negative, which is black. There are always eight positive, red and two negative, which is black, which we can see here. There are always eight positive red and two negative black in those panels. We also have false or true positive are black or, and red points below the line respectively. False or true negative are red or black points below above the line respectively. Type one and type two errors are the same as false positive and false negative respectively. So they now ask how many false positive, how many false negative do we have? How many true positive? How many true negative? How many type one error? How many type two error result from applying the Ben for only procedure to control the family-wise error rate at this? 0.05 probability level. So when we look at the panel here, we have three panels, okay? We have three panel, panel one, so panel three. So for panel one, so for panel one, how many false positive do we have? We have zero false positive. Guys, we are referring to these panels that we can get from that figure. That is where they summarize this. So for panel two, how many false positive? We have zero false positive. For panel three, we also have zero false positive. So how many false negative for panel one do we have? For panel one, we have one false negative. We have one false negative for panel two, and we have five false negative for panel three. We have five false negative. Let's see that panel three, that we have five false negative. I think those five false negative, it will be one, two, three, four, and five. So those, those are the five false negative we can get from panel three. So how many true positive? So for true positive for panel one, we have seven true positive, okay? For panel two, we also have seven true positive. So where, how can we find those seven true positive? So we can see we have how many true? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are the seven true positive for panel one. If you come down to panel two, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So those are the seven. Then we have for panel three, this is the value. So that is how we arrive at three true positive for panel three. So how many true negative do we have? For panel one, we have two. For, the, for across the three panels, we have all two, two, two true negative values. So. How many type one error do we have across the three panels? We have zero type one error across the three panels. So for type panel, type two errors for panel one, we have one type two error. For panel two, we have one type two error. For panel three, we have five uh, type two error. So that is that for the first uh, questions which they post to us. So they now ask the next question that how many false positive, how many false negative 
how many true positive, how many true negative, how many type one error, how many type two error result from applying the Holmes procedure to control the family wise error. Oh, sorry, you have a question. Oh, oh, am I the one raising my hand? Yeah, I think you are. Oh, sorry. Let me lower my hand. Wait, see. Start coming. Uh -oh. It's not coming up, it's not coming down. Why? It doesn't matter, we can continue. So let me just proceed. So for panel one, well, using the Holmes procedure, uh, we see that the false positive, we all have zero all true, zero false positive. While for false negative for panel one, we have one false negative. While the others, we have zero. For true positive for panel one, we have seven true positive. For panel two, we have eight true positive. For panel three, we also have eight true positive. For true negative, we have two true negative across the three panels. Why type one error, we have zero type one error across, across the three panels. Why type two error, we just have one type two error for panel one and zero type two error across the other two uh, panels. So that is what we're able to figure out from that uh, graph we got. So what is the, they now say in the C part, what is the false discovery rate associated with using the born for procedure to control the family-wise error rate at the 5% uh, probability rate? So here we see that the false discovery rate is the expected ratio of the false positive to total positive. So here we see that there are never any false positive that is black points below the line. So they are always the same number of total positive, which is always eight. So for panel one, two, three, this will be zero over eight. For panel two, zero over eight. And for panel three, zero over eight, uh, respectively. So they now say, what is the false discovery rate associated with using the Holmes procedure to control the family-wise error rate at five percent probability level? So it's still the same procedure. We are still having zero all over eight, uh, respectively. So for the E part, they say, how would the answers to A to, from between A to C change if we instead use the Ben Foroni procedure to control the family-wise error rate at the 0 0.001, that is the 99.99 probability level? Here we say that this will equate to a more stringent threshold, because we will not call any more false positive, so the result will not, uh, the result, uh, actually the result is not going to change. So question seven and question eight is just the applied exercise, it's just the applied. So question seven, they were using the, the CASIT data sets from the ISLR2 package. So the first question they say for each quantitative variable in, in the data set, besides sales, we should fit a linear model to predict sales using the quantitative variables that we should report the p-values associated with the coefficient for the variables. That is for each model of the form of y is equals to beta zero plus beta one of x plus the error term we should report the p-values associated with the coefficient that is beta one here, y represents sales and x represents uh, one 
of the quantitative, uh, I think one of the quantitative variables. So in that case, we are using the library ISLR2, okay? So we just create a vector of this uh, vector that is going to hold, uh, that is going to hold our, in the, our, our independent variable. So we have the p-val functions uh, to compute the p-values. We are using s apply, n of m. So we call in all those traits in, in the function of n. Then we summary lm for the summary of the model. So then we now suppose we control type one error at the 5% probability level, the p-value contained in A, which null hypothesis do we reject? So which null hypothesis do we reject? So here we say names of which p-values that are less than 0 0.05. So we can see the names of which p-values. So these ones are 0, 0.0, they are less than 0 0.05. All these ones, they are less than 0 0.05, while the other ones, they, they'll go above uh, 0 0.05. So we know we are we know the null hypothesis we are we are going to reject. Now suppose so the others we are, we fail to reject them. So now suppose we control the family worth y zero rates at five percent probability level for the p values. Which null hypothesis do we reject? Okay, so we can see the null hypothesis is going to be reject for this income for advertisement for price and also for and also for H because the P value, they are all less than 0 0.05. D, they said, suppose, finally suppose we control the false discovery rate at the level of 0 0.2 for the P values, which null hypothesis do we reject? So yeah, we reject null hypothesis for both income, advertisement, price, and also, and also H because the P values are less than 0 0.2 for the false discovery rate that we are controlling for. So in question eight, in this problem, they said we will simulate data from 100 fund managers, okay? So here we set a random seed, random, we set a random seed, then we create an object for number, which is 20, number of managers uh, is 100, then we create a matrix, okay? Then we set another seed, okay? We create the second, uh, the second matrix. Here we see that this data represent each fund manager's percentage return for each 20 months. Then we wish to test the null hypothesis that each fund manager's percentage return half population mean equal to zero. Then we notice that we simulated the data in such a way that each fund manager's percentage return do have population mean zero. In other words, all M null hypotheses are true. So yet we conduct a one sample T test for each fund manager and plot the histograms of P values obtained. So here we see that these are the p values. We are using apply family of function of x. Then, then we plot the histogram for each p value. And we can see uh, the shape. Okay. We can see the shape, which is somehow we can see the shape of our histogram for the various p values from zero to 1.0. So we can see that if we control that one error for each null hypothesis at 5% probability level, then how many null hypotheses do we reject? So here we can see that we are gonna reject four null hypotheses will be rejected because their p values are, are less than 0 uh, 0.05. So if we control the family-wise error rate at the 5% probability level, 
then how many null hypotheses do we reject? So in this case, we can see that we are rejecting zero null hypotheses will be rejected in that case. So for the D part 8D, we say if we control the false discovery rates at 5% uh, probability level, then how many null hypotheses do we reject? So we also see that we reject zero, zero null hypothesis. So the 8E now, suppose we cherry pick the 10 fund managers who perform the best in our data. If we control the family-wise error rate for just these 10 fund managers at the level of 0 0.05, then how many null hypotheses do we reject? If we control the false discovery rate for this, just these 10 fund managers at level of 0 0.05, then how many null hypotheses do we reject? So here in this case, we can see that we are rejecting just one null hypothesis at that probability level that we define. In the, in the second case here, we are also seeing that we, we are also rejecting, going to reject one null hypothesis. I think the last part is in F, I say we should explain why the analysis in E is misleading. Here they are saying that this is, the analysis in E is misleading because we are not correctly accounting for all tests performed because we are not accounting for all the tests in which we perform because cherry picking the similar Cherry picking is similar to repeating a test until it, by chance, we find a significant, uh, until we find uh, the significant results. So I think uh, uh, that that is, that is all I got from the chapter. It's still be worth us to still have some other thing I really, I uh, appreciate you. I think uh, you are really, really consistent. You followed all through from the, the beginning. I think you never misgive anyone. <laughs> Even me, I plan, if I still have time, I still plan, maybe I will still join the other cohorts in which they are planning to start soon. I will still, because I still really want to blend in this part of uh, Study school learning. I think I still I still have to go through the book again. If I, I pray, I will have that in my yeah, side. Yeah, there's a lot of content there for sure. Something I'll, I'll come back to again. Yeah, pretty often I think.